Hello everybody, this is a very greatly delayed answer to all the GGR questions uh, that came in at the end of last week. We're in Cape Town now and uh, Cape Town's pretty cool, I've got to say. A uh, beautiful sunny day today, no wind, the Cape Doctor has disappeared. That's the big uh, big breeze that goes right around by the Royal Cape Yacht Club. We sat there listening to it and watching it uh, uh, a couple of days ago. It was blowing 35 knots and more and uh, quite, quite strange, quite fun. Anyway, and uh, the club here has been fantastic. Uh, uh, we've got the Zodiac to uh, go meet everyone when they start arriving very soon. And we've got various uh, meetings happening, uh, lots going on. Anyway, and so there was a delay here to the question, sorry about that. And some of, most of them are all still relevant. Uh, the big question that is on everyone's lips is what's going on with the barnacles? And it's a real problem. And strangely, and I, this, this is my personal opinion now, you know, this gets very interesting because I'm also the organiser and I have an official line and I have a personal line. One of the things that gets tricky is we don't advise entrants on some of the things they do and uh, even though we know and have opinions on what they should do, we leave it to them because some will prepare better than others. And as an example, in the last uh, edition of the GGR, uh, three boats fitted both at wind vanes and I, you know, I follow wind vanes, know a little bit about what they're about and basically the, the first problem in that instance of the wind vanes weren't sized to the boats, that was the problem, that's the first problem. They were designed for smaller, lighter boats. They weren't designed for 36 foot, you know, 10 ton boats. And um, uh, that was an overload. And I knew that. I only pleaded with one of the entrants who was very close to not to do it before he bought one because I didn't think it was right. He'd previously had one on a much smaller boat, you know, like half the weight, was very happy with it. I said, look, please don't do it because we'd been talking for many years. He did do it and he didn't finish the race. And so when I, personally, when I see other things happening on the, on the boat, sometimes I'll say little things, but generally um, we don't get too involved because that's, that's what goes on. We do, it's hard to describe. We obviously give a lot of wealth of experience, but in the issue of um, you know, anti-fouling, we didn't go there. You know, people ask us questions, we give them answers, but we don't give recommendations. And um, again, uh, uh, you've got to look at what happened in the 2018, and you say to yourself, well, who survived and succeeded in terms of anti-fouling? And it was very obvious, it was spoken about a lot. And that was Jean-Luc Vanity. He was very particular, he's done a lot of solo circumnavigation before, he knows that, that paint's pretty important. And so he adopted a very simple process uh, to do that, which was widely reported at the end of the race. The brand was um, uh, clear to everyone, you know, and uh, the key to the preparation was to have a very high quality paint, and there's plenty of high quality paints out there, but it wasn't only the paint, it was the process, and the process was very simple. It was to put three coats of hard racing anti-fouling, right? And that means when you put it on, it gets very hard, and so when you wipe off stuff on it, you don't lose the paint. The other version of anti-fouling is called an ablative paint, right? And so the, the abrasion of the water moving past the paint will actually slowly take the surface off the paint. It actually just disappears and dissolves into the water, okay? So any bugs and any slime and any bits and pieces that get on it, first of all, it's really hard to stick to the ablative paint. And secondly, it sort of uh, dissolves a little bit and takes the you know, so anything that tries to catch onto the surface, it can't because the surface comes away and it comes off, all right? So they're the two differences in concepts for anti-fouling. It's a hard racing or a, an ablative paint. The hard racing, you can even polish it, get it super slippery, um, and it's, it's really cool. And, and John Luke's theory was, was really smart. And the idea was that he figured the ablative paint would actually, any of the barnacles or any of the pickup of weed or whatever growth you've got, it would get washed away as it's going down the Atlantic and it's about 7,000 miles. And so that paint after 7,000 miles would be pretty much all gone after the second coat, it's all gone. And when that happens is he would have then thought, this is exactly what happened, that, that when he got into the Southern Ocean, there's, there's very far less, there's a lot less barnacles in the Southern Ocean because the water's so much colder that it's not a big issue as it is in the warm waters of the Atlantic coming down. So by the time the two layers of ablative paint are gone, he's left with three layers of hard anti-fouling. Then he sails through the Southern Ocean, there's not much coming on board at that stage. And then by the time he comes back up the Atlantic, the zone where there is really intense uh, barnacle activity, you know, just north of the equator, he would have got through that and anything that hooked on at that stage, it's only been growing for, you know, weeks by the time he gets back to La Salle alone at the finish. And the reality was, you know, when we realised there was a barnacle problem, 
on the fleet in 2018. We looked very closely at Jean-Luc's boat when he came into uh, uh, Hobart at the, um, at the stopover and he had virtually no barnacles. The only barnacles that were hooking on the hull were above the waterline on the, on the, um, on the quarters, on both quarters where the, it's a lot in the water, you know, when the boat's healing and things like that. And there was virtually none under the water. When he finished the race and uh, pulled out in, in the Sabalone, there was a group of a, a few groups of barnacles. That was it, but it was basically nothing. Now, what's that tell you? If you're planning and preparing for the 2022 race, why wouldn't you just copy it? The brand name was there. It's publicised everywhere. Uh, the two types of anti-fouling were there. You could see the concept. It was really easy. And to the best of my knowledge, virtually none. There may have been one, um, but virtually none took on the same process. And what we're seeing now is an absolute repeat of what happened in 2018. Uh, that's not. That, 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 that's really sad. You know, I, I look at that and think crazy. And it's similar with some equipment, you know, I won't go into it, but even, you know, you've got to look at what went before and what worked and what didn't work. And, and some people have come along and say, oh, we've got something that's new or better or have an opinion that this piece works. I don't care what happened. If I was doing the 22, if I saw a bunch of boats were using a piece of equipment and it really worked, why wouldn't you just copy it rather than go reinvent the wheel and try something else that's, that increases the risk? So it, it's really sad, but, um, you know, we look at, um, uh, Jeremy with with copper coat big problem he's now desperately trying to work out what to do when he's when he's here and he's a local he's got to work out where to anchor uh, how it's going to happen he's not sure he thinks it's too deep and all this sort of stuff but he's got to stop the boat and, and try and do something with the barnacles that's part of the reason he's going slow at the moment Guy he's got the same brand name paint that that uh, Jean-Luc had but he didn't do the same applications and he didn't have the ablative versus the hard so Guy's got a massive problem it's cost you know potentially costing him the race um, and others have got problems as well. So uh, I think 2026 is going to be interesting to see if people look back at what did work. For, from us as an organiser, what we did, um, you know, the, the, the golden days of TBT or tin in anti-fouling, which was in the past, it's environmentally very bad, very damaging. Um, you can't use it anymore. Um, and that would have stopped a lot of it in, in, in years gone by. But now you, you have to use different, um, different types of compounds in the paints and it's not as effective, obviously. Also, I think it's pretty clear that the warmer water in the Atlantic can change the biometrics of so many different things or the, the, the biodata and how things uh, grow and uh, spread and so on in the ocean. And it seems to be there may be a lot more activity in the band below the Canaries and above the equator in the North Atlantic where they're, it's intensely active. And whether those are, are bands as well, we have a group of them here and another group there, and if you sail in between them, you might not get as many attacking the boat as what others had. That could be part of it as well. Um, but for sure, it's a new reality that people are going to have to deal with. And I'm sure even other, um, uh, you know, sort of circumnavigators in similar sized boats going not so fast um, are going to be uh, challenged. There's even Goose Barnacles getting on the towing line of the, the Walker trailing logs, for instance. So, uh, and speed is an issue, but it doesn't matter how fast your boat is, you'll still get barnacles on it, uh, within reason. I mean, if you're planing, you won't, but uh, slightly bigger boats may still have an issue as well. So uh, the other thing, of course, that Jean-Luc did in La Sable alone, there's some special conditions there. And one of them is that they have a big inland, inland sort of uh, lagoon, okay, just, just uh, one side of the marina, which they let all the water go into this lagoon and then they shut the gate and it sits there for three or four days. And then on, a, on the next high tide, they open up the gate and they flush all the water out, right? And uh, you get all these mud flats and beautiful ecosystems there. It's really fantastic. And they let it dry out for, the, for that tide. And then the new tide comes in and fills it up again. They shut the gate again. And it's part of the management of the whole environment there. And they do a really good job. But when they open the gate, you get a lot of sediment that comes out into the area of the, the marina, and uh, Jean-Luc was aware of that, so he put his whole boat in a bag, okay, which is what you used to do back in the 70s and maybe 80s as well when you're racing. Um, uh, gee, because it's a satellite call. Uh, just tell them to ring the, ring the, yeah, the yeah, hotline two. Number two. Uh, hotline two, yeah. Um, and uh, so he put it in a bag, which we used to do back in the racing days. He used to put chlorine in the water and it stops the bugs growing and stuff. He didn't put any chlorine or anything in the water uh, because uh, you don't do that, it's bad for the environment and it would potentially kill your anti-fouling. He used to do that when you had no anti-fouling in a polished fiberglass hull. So he did that for two reasons. One was to keep the sunlight off the paint. It was freshly applied. Keep the sunlight off the paint, which, which helps to keep it happening well. And then, um, 
uh, also to stop any sediment forming on the edges to give it the best chance to get out into the Atlantic in a clean state. And no one else did that, it wasn't banned, anyone could do it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in 2026. Anyway, I've spent way too long on that subject. Uh, there was a fantastic article that was done uh, with Barry Pickpill, our uh, communications guy back in 2018, and Yachting World, which we publicised extensively on Facebook. You can see links to it there. It tells you a lot about what's, what happened in 2018. Uh, it mentions the brand names of the paint that John Luke had. And uh, you know, if you're into it, just make sure you read that article because it was a comprehensive breakdown of what happened um, uh, at that time. So, uh, okay, now that's enough on that. Uh, let's get into the questions. Uh, so we've got uh, uh, a French one here, um, and it says, I'm just translating, oh, <laughs> it says, don't talk so fast. Uh, a little like we talk on a VHF uh, communications. We can follow and understand. Thank you, sorry, Jean-Pierre. I was obviously talking a bit fast then, trying to get things uh, across as quick as I possibly could. Uh, so, um, uh, Eric uh, Spielman, I'm completely surprised about the decision of Guy to head so far south to Punta Lest. It must have been a very tough decision for him, completely off track and so on. Wouldn't Cape Town be better? Uh, basically, uh, reading between the lines, I think you see a situation where Guy is completely um, uh, assess the situation. I'm not sure he's going to continue. He has a lot of friends in Punta Leste in Uruguay uh, who will be able to help him and support him. Let's wait and see what happens when he gets there. Maybe he'll get it together. He will absolutely be in Chichester class. Uh, but I think uh, if he really wanted to carry on, uh, he would have struggled to get to Cape Town and try and work out something there. But who knows? I don't know exactly what he's thinking, but it may be in his own mind he's thinking and he'll be reflecting now. Can he really and does he really want to continue now that he's not really racing anymore too far behind the game because of the barnacles mike phillips as i recall in 2018 uh, at some stopovers they did not allow cleaning barnacles inside ter territorial waters i think it was hobart can you comment absolutely in fact uh, i do i spent a lot of time 20 odd seasons in antarctica and visited the sub antarctic islands of new zealand and uh, so on for you know sort of 50 times it's extremely strong um, quarantine issues for marine growth. You don't want to transfer marine growth into different regions. And Hobart is an island within Australia, which is one of the world's biggest islands. And we're really protective of, of uh, you know, foreign introduced species coming into the waters. Now, I should have known that. And it, my, you know, passion for the GGR, I completely forgot it. And when the first couple of entrants came through, they started cleaning the, cleaning the bottom of their boat which is extremely banned and illegal because you don't know what that growth is and where it's come from. As it turns out, they analysed the barnacles and it wasn't as bad as what they expected. There are a common variety of barnacles that's already known to be in Australia, but nonetheless, it's completely banned. So we quickly stopped everyone, you know, under threat, quite rightly. The authorities got onto us and said, you can't do that because the Australian authorities have been really good supporting the GGR and letting us bring the boats in even though they're not entering all these things. Um, and so now in the notice of race, anyone that touches, touches the hull underwater on a GGR boat when they're in Australian waters is a $5,000, 5,000 euro fine from GGR. Okay, we fine the entrance 5,000 euro and uh, possibly a time penalty as well uh, because we, uh, you know, it's illegal. You can't do it. The entrance can get in the water and look at the hull and they can clean the, uh, the top sides, but they cannot, you know, just polish it or do whatever. They can't touch any of the growth. So that's a reality of, of Australia and quarantine and uh, um, doing the right thing. So they won't be able to clear barnacles in Australia. They need to do it before they get there. Um, everywhere else, it's not a problem. Um, so uh, from, uh, got a question. As the skippers are facing challenges on weather information, how far will be possible in risky southern, how far it will be possible in risky southern ocean? Hope all sailors will pass through safely. Doing a great job, Borough. So uh, yeah, weather information is part of the challenge of the GGR. We make it very clear. You get no, uh, no special exemptions on anything. Uh, you can use your HF radio, you can use your barometer, barograph. We're allowing a, a, a weather fax if someone wants to fit a weather fax. Uh, but you, know, you don't have to get all the latest weather to uh, be safe in the Southern Ocean. You need to be safe in the Southern Ocean anyway. You can work out what's going on. These boats aren't fast enough to move away from the weather. Um, so as an individual sailing in the Southern Ocean in these types of boats, people do it, you know, have done it a lot in, in the past and they're doing it now in the GGR again. That's part of the challenge. 
And uh, as an organiser of the race, without obligation, we provide uh, weather routing and weather information, details, uh, detailed information uh, in a safety situation where we think there's big storms coming or something, we'll tell them what's happening ahead of time and we'll uh, give them some advice on some of the things that they could or should do to minimise the impact of that storm. But that's not obligation, no obligation on us to do it mandatorily sort of thing. And it's not, the entrant isn't obliged to uh, uh, carry uh, through with the advice and opinions we give them. It's up to them to make their own decisions. And that's the challenge of the GGR. Uh, Giannis, uh, hi, not, not so clear to me if the entrants have to approach Cape Town from the south. Is there any waypoint in Cape Town and so on? When I'm talking about uh, boats approaching Cape Town from the southwest, if you look at any uh, ocean passage of the world, any pilot books, uh, any sailing manual that's saying, you know, if you're heading towards Cape Town from the Atlantic, from the other side, this is what you're supposed to do. It's all there. They all say, watch out for the southeasterly. Uh, you know, you get caught with that, you'll never get to Cape Town. You'll get blown north and you'll be really struggling. So the safest standard procedure for an approach is to approach from the southwest, but it's not mandatory. Anyway, you know, it's up to them how they want to do it. And as it turns out, uh, Simon's cool he's going straight in from the east <laughs> so raising a few eyebrows and he's done really well uh sunny asks is there a preferred latitude that skippers take in the southern ocean uh well yes and no i mean if you want to go the shortest distance you go down to 60 degrees south it's a lot lot less than the great circle route but we don't allow it uh, you've got to stay above a uh, mandatory ice we, we call it a, a ice limit zone or whatever but the idea of that is mainly to keep boats high enough so that if they ever, ever needed assistance, the rescue coordination centres in Africa or Australia or New Zealand don't have to dip down south and far south. So that's part of the reason as well, because we talk to those organisations and they give us their opinions and suggestions and strong advice and we agree with it. So, um, so you know, and you'll see, it. we're just putting those zones onto the tracker. You'll see them pop up as a big orange area and boats aren't to go south of those lines. So, uh, but, but also in the, in the history of things, the roaring 40s is where the westerlies are. So they'll come down to the, to the 40 degree latitudes, right? That's 40 degrees south of the equator and uh, sail along that area and generally you get westerly winds and that's pretty much what's happening now. Um, so 40, the roaring 40s is the place to be. Uh, John Edward, I uh, hope another question is okay. I'm very curious about those weather boys. Uh, how many are there and how, who owns them and are they in all our oceans? Okay, so these computer modeling weather information is all generated by weather stations giving the real-time barometric pressure, the uh, cloud covers, this is on land, you know, all the little country towns will send back information and tell you the wind direction, wind strength, the barometric pressure, cloud cover, temperature, you know, when there's rainfall, and every, they do that every six hours. We've done that as a ship at sea. We've been an official reporting station, so every six hours you have to report this in a special code. And they come from all over the world, they go into a central data bank, and that's the information that forms the models to come up with these computer projections of what's happening with the weather. Now in the ocean, there's no little country town. So what they have is these floating buoys that do all sorts of things. You get sea surface uh, temperature, you get salinity, you get daylight or nighttime. You know, they measure that some of the sophisticated ones will have light sensors to tell if it's cloudy or sunny. Uh, you'll get uh, certainly the barometric pressure. They some measure wave height as well and all this sort of stuff. And they're drifting, okay? And they're put out there by volunteers. Usually I've probably, in my time so far, I think I've probably launched about uh, 20 of these, 20, 30 of these boys on the various ships that we had, we'd be asked to drop them going down to Antarctica and you'll see guys in other yacht races, you know, bigger boats, they'll, they'll launch these boys. And, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, World Meteorology Organization works out where they need to be and then other groups put them in and each country has a responsibility to try and help that collection of data and then the computer models take it from there. How many's out there? I have no idea, um, but, uh, you know, Commercial ships drop them for for uh, the weather organisations and volunteers and yachties and stuff as well. So, uh, but I've launched a lot of them. It's quite fun. Um, okay, are ferro cement yachts eligible for GGR? No, they're not. Uh, you've got to be a fiberglass production boat or a Haley replica that could be fiberglass, uh, timber, steel, aluminium, whatever. Uh, but we only allow uh, replicas of Suhaili to be different material. Uh, John Stewart, hi Don. Now the skippers are so far offshore, away from the majority of shipping, I assume they are sleeping for longer periods, 
rather than catnapping? Do you think they reduce sail overnight? Well, they're still going as fast as possible. Surely the, uh, there's a trade-off for a comfortable sleep and not having to run around the deck to reef in the middle of the night. What would you do? Well, okay, uh, it depends on the sailor. Uh, one of the things I'm extremely sceptical about is when you read reports of sailors saying, oh, I only sleep for 10 minutes at a time, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Certainly you can catnap, but no one goes around the world sleeping at 10 minutes at the time, no matter what anyone tells me, it's not physically possible. Um, you've got to get some sleep, and uh, certain situations give you a better opportunity than others. It, it's quite normal for people to get 20-minute catnaps for a number of hours, you know, 20 minutes here, they're up for an hour, another 20 minutes up for an hour, but you can't do that forever, okay? There are times when you have to get a good solid sleep and uh, you pick the least risk times for that um, and uh, you, everyone manages it differently. I don't, you know, some people go into sleep therapy and check all these, you know, all the biometrics again on, on what's right for them and that's very good for them because they're extremely competitive, top flight, international, you know, elite sailors, uh, but for most of the GGR guys, it's pretty basic. You know, when you get tired, you've got to have a sleep. When you've got to stay up, you've got to stay up. And uh, uh, high risk times, you know, there's shipping there, so you sleep less. Uh, the most, in my circumnavigation, the least slip, sleep I got was in the doldrums and so on. So frustrating trying to get breeze, the boat won't steer under, under wind vanes or pilots, even, you know, because there's no wind, you've got to be up, and it's terrible. In the Southern Ocean, you get a lot of sleep because there's a lot less shipping. Uh, you know what you set the boat up to go. And in the Southern Ocean, there's a set formula. You have big cloudy areas and underneath those clouds, the wind will increase you know, by 10, 15 knots, okay? And then in between the cloud areas, these big squalls, uh, the wind is uh, a lot less. So what I did during the day, I would set my boat up in the Southern Ocean to be absolutely perfect in between the clouds because when the wind increased, under the clouds, uh, these big squalls, uh, the boat would rocket along, but I'd be able to manage it. If I thought I had to put a reef in, I'd put a reef in, do whatever. In the Southern Ocean, the days are a lot, sh lot longer because the, you know, you're so far south. The nights only may last for five hours, four or five hours. And so what I would do then is before I went down at the nighttime, I would put a reef in and set the boat up to be comfortable underneath the, the squalls, the clouds. You couldn't see them coming. And it meant you went a little bit slower between those squalls, but you didn't have to come up and reef all the time, right? So I literally would do that. And I would never sleep for longer than two hours. I had a clock timer. So every two hours, brrr, get up, stick my head in the bubble, look around, check everything's right, have a drink, write up the log, and then say, yep, it's cool, go, to, go back down again during the night. And then the times, in the, as soon as it's first light, you get up, go out in the cockpit, and you have a really good check of everything, make sure everything looks right. Sometimes I use a binoculars to check something if I didn't want to go forward or up the mast. And uh, once you've got that settled, have another drink, something to eat, write the log. And my biggest sleep would always be in the morning when it's daylight, you know, after dawn, because uh, you're really relaxed.